So we're kicking off today with something important in clinical care, respiratory disorders. These conditions aren't just complex, but also incredibly impactful for clinical practice. I mean, we're talking about asthma, COPD, interstitial lung disease, pulmonary hypertension, the whole spectrum. Each of them comes with unique challenges for diagnosis and management. But Ethan, how about we start with the basics here? The respiratory system itself. What's happening when this vital body system isn't working properly? Absolutely, Yenna. The respiratory system primarily serves two essential functions, delivering oxygen to the bloodstream and removing carbon dioxide from the body. When this system falters, it disrupts gas exchange at the alveolar level. What we see then are conditions like airflow obstruction in asthma or structural damage in COPD, each with its own underlying mechanisms. That's where understanding the pathophysiology becomes so significant. It gives us the tools to intervene more effectively. Right? And diagnostic tools. These play a massive role in distinguishing these disorders especially with overlaps in symptoms like dyspnoia or wheezing. Spirometry is like the gold standard here, isn't it? It really is, Yenna. Spirometry allows us to measure lung function quantitatively. For instance, an FEV1 to FVC ratio of less than 0.70 strongly suggests COPD, while in interstitial lung disease the ratio is a lot higher. These ratios help us differentiate between obstructive or restrictive lung disease. And we mustn't forget the importance of bronchodilator reversibility tests. Improvements in FEV1 is often observed in asthma following bronchodilator therapy. Yes, and this is where nurses play such a vital role, right? Because interpreting these differences and keeping patients informed. Exactly, Yenna. And speaking of patient management, I attended a health conference recently where an updated clinical guideline on asthma was spotlighted. One of the key takeaways was the renewed emphasis on avoiding suboptimal asthma management, especially the importance of combining inhaled corticosteroids with bronchodilators as first-line therapy for persistent asthma alongside newer pharmacological options. Oh, that's fascinating, Ethan. Tailoring care for patients, even with mild asthma, is such an important area because nearly half of patients with asthma are not optimally controlled. Now? When you think about it, these advancements underline how diagnostic tools aren't just technical. Ethan, speaking of tailoring care and diagnostic tools, let's dig deeper into two of the most prominent respiratory disorders, asthma and COPD. They're often grouped together, but they are fundamentally quite different. Asthma, chronic, inflammatory, reversible airflow obstruction versus COPD, progressive and often irreversible. What makes their distinction so vital in clinical practice? That's a great point, Yenna. The distinction between asthma and COPD starts with their pathophysiology. Asthma involves airway hyperresponsiveness and inflammation triggered by things like allergens or respiratory infections. It's TH2 cell driven. Our COPD though often results from long-term exposure to irritants, most commonly smoking, or less commonly conditions like alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. The pathophysiology there centers around chronic inflammation and structural changes. Think mucus hypersecretion in chronic bronchitis or alveolar destruction in emphysema. Yes. And that brings us to pharmacological management, bronchodilators. They're a key pillar for both asthma and COPD, but the approach varies, doesn't it? It does. For asthma, bronchodilators like short-acting beta agonists, SABAs, such as salbutamol, are often used as relievers. For COPD, we lean heavily on both long-acting beta agonists, or LABAs, like salmeterol, and long-acting miscarinic antagonists. Llamas, like teotropium. These are maintenance therapies aimed at improving lung function long-term and preventing exacerbations. Hold on. Salbutamol. This reminds me of a case with a patient who, after frequent use, became tachycardic. Her heart rate was, like, through the roof. Ah, classic. 
Salbutamol acts on beta-2 adrenergic receptors, which relax the airway's smooth muscles, but it also has an off-target effect on the heart's beta-1 receptors, particularly at high doses. And don't forget, it can also lower serum potassium, leading to hyperkalemia, which has its own risks. Right. And as nurses, we've got to monitor these patients closely. Heart rate, electrolytes, especially with higher or frequent doses. Spotting this early can really save lives. Absolutely. And this illustrates a critical aspect of patient care. Pharmacological interventions are powerful, but they're also double-edged swords. Understanding the side effects allows us to balance the therapeutic benefits against potential risks effectively. Yes, Ethan, speaking of striking that balance, let's really dive into managing these conditions. It's clear that it goes beyond just prescribing medications, right? Beta-2 agonists, corticosteroids, leukotriene antagonists play their part. But what about the non-pharmacological interventions? that are just as pivotal. You're absolutely right, Yenna. Non-pharmacological strategies are often just as critical. For asthma, avoiding triggers can make a world of difference. Dust mites, pollen, cigarette smoke, you name it. Similarly, for COPD, smoking cessation is, without question, the single most effective intervention to slow disease progression. Oh, right. Smoking cessation programs are lifesavers. But I have to say, Ethan, it's not always easy convincing patients to stick with these things, even when they know how important they are. And that's where pulmonary rehabilitation comes in. It combines exercise training, education and psychological support to really empower patients. It's about giving them the tools and confidence to manage their condition actively. Empowerment is key, isn't it? And with that comes education. Like How often do patients misuse their inhalers? It's shocking, but something as basic as teaching proper inhaler technique can make a massive difference in controlling symptoms. It really can. And when we look at adherence to medication, that's another area where tailored patient education comes into play, explaining why medications like inhaled corticosteroids aren't just for symptom relief, but also for long-term control, can be eye-opening for patients. Totally. Patients often stop taking controllers because they don't see immediate results. That's where we need to step in, right? Help them understand the bigger picture, why consistency matters. I actually had a patient who, well, let's just say education was a game-changer for her. And that's a perfect example of the critical role healthcare providers play. We're not just clinicians, we're educators, motivators, and sometimes cheerleaders. The relationship we build with patients can directly influence their outcomes. Couldn't agree more. And you know, Ethan, maybe the next step is innovation, like apps that track medication use, or even gamification strategies to improve adherence. What do you think? I think we're heading there, Yena. The integration of technology into patient care, smart inhalers, telehealth. It's all designed to make managing these conditions easier and more interactive. But at the end of the day, it comes down to understanding the patient's unique challenges and customising solutions. Exactly. Tailored care, innovative tools and clear education. It's like the trifecta for success. And there's so much potential to do more. I mean... Imagine the outcomes if we really nail this across the board. It's exciting to think about, isn't it? But for now, just focusing on the basics. Good education, strong clinical guidance and evidence-based interventions can already make a significant difference. Completely agree. And on that inspiring note, I think we're ready to wrap it up here. Ethan, as always, it's been insightful and, well, just a lot of fun diving into all this with you. Likewise, Yenna, always great to explore these topics with someone as passionate as you. And to all our listeners, thanks for joining us. Remember, these management strategies can save lives, and it all starts with knowing the right steps to take. On that note, see you next time. Take care, everyone.